May we call on Mr. Francis Estrada, the President. To start the program, may I call on Jaime Augusto Sobel de Ayala, Chairman of the Ayala Corporation of the Philippines, and Chair of the Bridges to Dialogue Towards Culture of Peace for his welcome remarks. Your Excellency, President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, Honorable Members of the Cabinet, Honorable Members of the Senate and Congress, Honorable Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining us here today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this ASEAN-wide series entitled Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, and to the launch of the Philippine portion of the Bridges program. Bridges is facilitated by the Vienna-based International Peace Foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Today marks the launching of a series of talks to be delivered from November 2007 to April 2008 by Nobel laureates in the fields of peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. These events will be hosted and organized in different parts of the country in cooperation with partners, including the country's major universities. This program, which started in Thailand in 2003 to 2005, now expands into ASEAN, with the Philippines joining in 2007 to 2008, and the Malaysia series commencing in 2008 to 2009. The Bridges series is an independent contribution to the decade of a culture of peace and nonviolence initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. Bridges represents an intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace, providing an opportunity for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, and the media and youth can meet, share viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways to develop understanding and cooperation. I can't think of a more opportune time than today to begin this dialogue, with no less than the intellectual capital provided by Nobel laureates to contribute to the conversation. In a highly interdependent world, problems can only be solved by finding ways of continuing to work together. The topics which will be presented over the next six months of this series will deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world and well presented over a wide range of issues in the fields of politics, economy, science, culture, and media. They will especially highlight the challenges of globalization and regionalism and its impact on development and international cooperation. We're very pleased to welcome the Bridges series to the Philippines, not only for its contribution to an important intellectual discourse, but also because it aims to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia, with our multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with people in other parts of the world. We hope that the series serves as a bridge between the Nobel laureates and local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the series may lead to better cooperation for the advancement of development and growth in the region, especially if it engages many of the younger generation, which is, of course, ASEAN's key to the future. I wish to acknowledge quite specifically and quite specially the vision and untiring efforts of Mr. Uwe Morowitz, who is here with us today, 
Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, for conceptualizing and making the Bridges program a reality for all of us here in ASEAN. It is mainly through his efforts that the Nobel laureates have come together and agreed to engage in lectures and conversations within ASEAN. I'd like to say thank you also to everyone present today, especially uh, President Magpagara Royo for hosting this event. May it help us all to facilitate the culture of peace and development through dialogue. It is in this spirit that we welcome all of you here today to launch Bridges in the Philippines. And uh, it is my understanding uh, that Professor Mandel will also be addressing us after lunch today. Thank you again to everyone. Can we ask uh, Mr. Jaime Sobel de Ayala to remain on stage, please? To launch the Bridges program in the Philippines, Mr. Sobel will present to the President a copy of the complete program of the Bridges event series from November to April in the Philippines. Mr. Uwe Morovic will now present to Her Excellency a golden thigh art piece as a symbol of the turnover from Thailand to the Philippines of the Bridges Program. We also Thank you very much, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen. We have just launched the Bridges Program in the Philippines. Lunch will now be served, and after which, the most awaited keynote speech and talk by Professor Mondel. Thank you and a pleasant day to all. Thank you very much for that introduction. Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, officials, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure for me to be here in the Philippines, here for the second time. I was here back in uh, 2001, at the time the World Bank had a conference on uh, pro-poor growth, and I, I gave a keynote speech to that. Uh, in the talk today, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, megatrends, globalization, independence management, harmony as a goal, and Asian currency and world money. Uh, the world economy, this is a unique period. Unique period because the year 2007 is the only year, perhaps the first year in global history where all the major economies have been moving together very fast. They've, uh, uh, you have the, um, the North America, Europe, and Japan, and China, those big four economies now. We have to put China into the big four because it's now a three trillion dollar economy. And then four other countries very big, the biggest of the emerging market countries that are left if we take China out, no longer the BRIC, I think of the BRIM nations, Brazil, Russia, India, and Mexico. And then all the other countries, including the Philippines and, and uh, 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 Thailand, and uh, uh, Nigeria, Egypt, and so on. So never before has this happened. Why is that the case? What's going on? Well. This is a, a view of the international system as I look at it. I look at it as a series of globes or currency areas. And those uh, m areas represent perhaps monetary power. Monetary power is more or less proportioned to GDP. The, the central area is the uh, US, the biggest economy in the world, $14 trillion economy. And then the euro area, which is about 11 trillion, then the yen, the Japanese area of four and a half trillion, and then China has become the fourth largest in that category, out 
taking over from the United Kingdom. And uh, th these are the biggest economies in the world. And uh, what are the drivers that make this uh, all working at this time? Well, uh, we've got globalization, which is came about as a result of the end of the Cold War. Globalization is a natural state of mankind if it's not split into blocks. And with the breakdown of the, well, you first of all had uh, China entered the globalization group uh, in um, uh, 1978 or 1980, and then uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, uh, former satellites of the Soviet Union entered it in uh, 1990. And that, uh, that has made globalization possible. It's also been associated a little bit with the uh, single superpower uh, and the system of peace that results from that. The replacement of the balance of terror as it was under the dual system with the single superpower, which has its defects of a different kind, I suppose. Then the IT revolution, which came about uh, is largely as a result of uh, in my view, a little bit prejudiced uh, uh, because of the big tax cuts in the 1980s and the very strong, uh, efficient, more efficient American economy as a result of that, and the uh, Silicon Valley IT revolution came out. And this is lowering uh, costs, increasing productivity in every sphere of economic life in firms, households, institutions, and governments. And it's even if it's still rapidly expanding. Every year we have big new changes in technology, but even if we didn't have any new, new technology, just the deepening of the existing technology in all the countries, and especially in the um, poorer countries, would be an increasing, a source of increasing productivity and growth uh, for the world, and that's the, and the fourth thing I want to mention is the rise of China the new big 800-pound gorilla on the block, or maybe 800-kilogram gorilla on the block, a very big thing, enough to make a big change in the picture. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, and the American ambassador to uh, London, the court of St. James, was um, asked to give uh, uh, a speech on the greatest fact, what was called by at Cambridge University called The Greatest Fact in Modern History, which was, uh, according to what his prescription was, the United States, the rise of the United States. Because 100 years before that, by, by around 1792, the United States was 4 million people. And now by 1906, it had become uh, 105 million people. And the biggest economy in the world by far and within 10 years, it would be bigger than the next three biggest economies uh, put together, uh, bigger than Britain, Germany, and France put together. So now China is not quite in the same category as that, but it's still a big, going to have a very big impact on the future of this, uh, the rest of this century. Four challenges to the uh, world economies, adjusting to globalization, absorbing, spreading the IT revolution, fitting China into the world economy, and stabilizing currency areas. And the factors then uh, uh, of growth, we've mentioned that. Now, um, I mentioned globalization began after China joined the world economy, and then it became a buzzword after the Cold War War ended. Associated today, uh, a little bit with the, it's not used, this term isn't used, the Pax Americana. Pax means, of course, peace. <laughs> uh, and of course, there's a, a wars associated with it. But the, so we're in a period of great peace. The post war period has been a period of comparative peace in the world economy. So unlike the, uh, uh, the first part of the, uh, of, the, of the 20th century. Now, the entire world is now involved in. In, this, in globalization except to Cuba, North Korea, Myanmar, and maybe Iran and Venezuela. Globalization is a process that means integration at the world level. It proceeds by openness, the natural state of the world. It's not unique to our age. Globalization has had many dimensions, has many dimensions. 
economic integration, political, cultural, social, religious, and military. These are, this is the way I look at on that process of globalization, degrees of it by area and period. And I, uh, I don't, um, don't want to, we're not doing a history lesson. This is uh, uh, the way I look at the world in terms of these categories of integration, globalization. But just look at the last part of it, where uh, at least the way, by, through my eyes, I see high, degrees of integration of, on all these categories together, even in religious integration, because much more than before, because it's not necessarily that we have the same religion, but uh, we know about each other's religion to a level and a degree that would, never was the case before. So each uh, dimension of globalization is achieved to a degree depending on culture, and every, every country has to uh, adapt to it in ways that suit their own peculiarities. It's, uh, uh, we have to make, bear in mind things like cultural diversity. Cultural diversity is something that people want to protect. We don't want globalization and integration to mean homogenization. We don't want the whole world all, all the same. And, um, and cultures will try to keep their own, uh, own dimension of that. But even if we get to an equilibrium degree of globalization, um, it's not going to stay that way because innovation is changing the world all the time. Look back in the past 10 centuries and you get all these industrial revolutions that, that go back from you know, printing press, gunpowder. Every time you get one of these new changes, you, and most recently the computer IT revolution, you uh, have, uh, have a, new, a new framework of thinking, a new, a new ballpark, if you like. Uh, the computer IT revolution is very important because it's uh, democratic in a way. Uh, if countries, if people have get to a certain level uh, of uh, education where they can access the, uh, use a computer and access the internet, if they can get to that level, they have access to knowledge and technology never before, not dreamed of before. Just go back a hundred years, go back even 25 years and knowledge and technology is very expensive and this cheapens m very important part of the fact of, of, of production. Well, anyway, countries have to decide how far they're going to go and, and, uh, and, and see which way they have to, uh, have to stop and, and so on. Remembering these different societies, cultural diversity, different societies, religions, geographies have different needs, difficulties, inland states, are very different from border states, uh, island states like uh, like the Philippines and so on, with then 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 uh, countries that uh, are, are inside access to transport. Think of a country like Mongolia inside, Nepal inside. Uh, how much transportation and, and political um, 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 uh, uh, compromises with its neighbors are an important part in order to just access and get into globalization. So per capita incomes are affected very much by geographical situations. Now, globalization means interaction and in, in, inter, um, um, interdependence. Uh, we're on in, in each other. Globalization means integration with neighbors, and that means independence. Different types of independence you get. You get interdependence through trade, and that's important. And then you get interdependence through even more through changes in factors of production, immigration, and uh, emigration, and capital movements, and, and the international monetary scene. But the fundamental goal of interdependence management uh, may require an institution uh, because you don't want uh, interdependence management normally in a, with many, many sovereign entities can't typically be bilateral. It's not efficient to have bilateral agreements. First of all, <clears throat> because of big and small countries. There's an asymmetry between big and small countries. You can't leave things out uh, uh, with that. So you need rules, uh, rules typically to protect the smaller countries against the bigger countries. 
and you need uh, the institutions that manage that, it, those, that it depends. The IMF is one of those things, and it's a place I worked for, for uh, in the early 60s, and um, a very efficient institution. Um, but efficiency is only good if the ends are right. <laughs> and sometimes the IMF might be doing the wrong thing, so it's a very efficient institution. I concede that, but if it's, if it's doing the wrong thing, if it's got the wrong goals, it's, not, it's pushing the wrong system, then I don't uh, I agree with it. Uh, in the 1980s, you have the, the uh, I argue that if we are really honest with ourselves, we don't have a good international monetary system. You could argue we don't have a system at all. We have uh, the movement to flexible exchange rates really was a movement toward monetary nationalism. Every country has their own money. They make their own money independently. And the, the historical uh, systems, monetary systems, have been um, typically international systems involving uh, sharing of different things or use of a common uh, vehicle. Like all the countries of the, uh, uh, before, let's say, 1914, uh, typically had either gold or silver standards. They agreed on a common money. Now, they were all independent. They had an independent policy. But if they chose to use gold as their money, that gave them fixed exchange rates. Because if each, under a gold standard, uh, countries' uh, currencies are different, are names for different weights of gold. The silver standard is the same thing. And under uh, bimetallism, which was even better, bimetallism was an ingenious thing, sometimes a little difficult to understand, but bimetallism was a good system in a way because it fixed the price of the relative price of gold and silver. So that it, whether a country was on a silver standard or a gold standard, uh, they had fixed exchange rates because the price of gold and silver was fixed. And so uh, uh, that, uh, that gave the world integration, integrated money. It's strange, isn't it, that in the period of greatest globalization today, we have the least globalization in the framework of money. A tremendous amount of monetary integration 100 years ago under the gold standard, and even more under bimetallism, which broke up in 1873. Uh, we had great integration then, uh, but we didn't have globalization to the same degree. Now hey, we check. have globalization, yeah. but we don't have the... Uh, hey, check, one, two, three. What? Oh. <laughs> um, so, what, anyway, uh, the, the system that worked out uh, that we got flexible exchange rates, but then, uh, well, in the 1980s, the United States didn't like what, what flexible exchange rates was giving us. And uh, this, particularly uh, the Plaza Accord was an example of this. Flexible exchange rates had, uh, had uh, led to uh, the system. Now, the, it led to the overvaluation of the dollar. Now, this, this overvaluation uh, came about because something went wrong with the dollar system. In the 19, well, first of all, I, I guess I should mention that uh, the dollar standard began in the World War I, when the dollar took over from the pound sterling as the most important currency in the world. And we've been in different forms of dollar standards ever since World War I. Uh, and the dollar has gone through strong periods and weak periods. It's gone through crises, and, and then something has happened to it. There was a crisis of the dollar in 19, the 1930s, among other countries. Other countries had crises too, but there was a crisis of the dollar. And then the
started in February 1973, and then, then even that didn't, that just whetted the appetite of speculators, and then the system broke up in 1973. But after it broke up, the dollar of this period was weak, big flight from the dollar, but then George Shultz, the Treasury Secretary, the uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, um, Helmut Schmidt, the Minister of Finance, Germany later Chancellor, uh, and uh, Giscard d'Estaing, Minister of Finance in France, agreed to go up, go for flexible exchange rates without any plan. There was no big plan for it. They just got there. George Shultz was a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. He'd been the dean of uh, the business school, and then he went into the Nixon cabinet, was a very valuable official, and he became Secretary of the Treasury, but he was a, 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 an acolyte of Milton Friedman, you know, who was pushing flexible exchange rates. But George Schultz, he's a, a great man in a way, but his field was never money, it was, he was a labor economist. He was negotiating in labor, that was his forte, and he was very smart at, at doing all that. But we got into flexible exchange rates. Now, two of those people, uh, Helmut Schmidt, and who became Chancellor of, the, of Germany, and uh, Giscard de Saint, said they made a mistake back in 1973. They said they made a mistake. They shouldn't have done it. It was a bad idea to do this because the flexible system wasn't any good. And so those two people got together at the Bremen summit and decided Europe had to have a monetary system and they formed the European monetary system one year later. And then Europe went the, exactly the opposite way, away from flexible rates into the currency area that came about 20 years after that to be the euro area. So this was their rejection of it while the IMF and the United States were pushing flexible exchange rates on countries. And that involved splitting up, breaking up those uh, uh, all the Latin American economies that had uh, fixed exchange rates for 50 years, seven countries going back 100 years with fixed exchange rates, they were all broken up into flexible rates and many of the countries got into hyperinflation. Mexico in 1976 uh, had had uh, 22 years of a fixed exchange rate based on an eight cent peso. And um, they, uh, 1976, what happened to Mexico? They discovered oil, They're sitting on a big oil basket, and suddenly then the IMF pushed them into flexible, into a big devaluation. Why they need to devalue when they've got the oil and capital was coming in, and they've had a five cent peso. And then that led to hyperinflation in Mexico in the next decade, the next whole decade was a decade of rampant inflation in Mexico, and then the debt crisis in Mexico, despite their oil, the policy was so wrong, and then Mexico had to have a currency reform in the 1990s. They had locked off some zeros. They had a currency reform, they got back in. But that story of Mexico was all over Central America. They moved from a, a good monetary systems, by and large, based on the dollar, to, to uh, flexible systems, and they all went into rampant inflation. So the only country, the country in Latin America, which has had the most stable currency in Latin America in the Western Hemisphere, except for the United States, was Panama. Because Panama uh, had a treaty in 1904 with the United States saying that it wouldn't create a paper currency of its own. It created, it has its own currency, the Balboa. And that was equal to a dollar. But the dollars were the American dollars, so there was no, they still have that, and they have had the American rate of inflation for a century, 103 years with the American rate of inflation. Not perfect by any means. World War I, World War II inflation, the late 1970s, too much inflation and so on, but they've had that, they had that, and they still have that today. So um, the, anyway, the tempting, pushing Japan into, uh, appreciation wasn't good. Uh, this, uh, this is a mistake here. It should be Japan bashing in the 1980s to force Japan into undesirable currency appreciation. At the time of the Plaza Accord, September 22nd, 1985, the dollar was 239 yen. And that was when the U.S. got the G5 
together to get a depreciation of the dollar. I, 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 was, uh, I, I supported that. In fact, <laughs> it's going to sound strange if I say this, but in a way it was my idea. Meeting in Bermuda in June, and I suggested to him this was the way to, uh, way to go about it, and he was very interested, and we talked about it on the way to the airport. And uh, he, he was the uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury then. And, uh, and I said to him, even, don't have the G7 there. Canada, my country, <laughs> and Italy aren't players in this. Have the G5 together. And that's what happened in, in the Plaza Accord. They got the G5 together. Now, that little thing of don't, don't have Italy and Canada had a boomerang effect uh, later on. Two years later at the Plaza Accord, uh, at the uh, Louvre meeting of the G7 in, uh, in, in Paris, um, they agreed on something. And then they wanted the G7 to uh, agree to it. But Italy absolutely refused because the newspapers were saying, oh, Italy's just a rubber stamp for, you know, they, they're so, so it was a political, it was a big mistake to do it that way. But I'm just saying, the idea was, was a good idea because this inflation rate had been 13% um, uh, in 1911, it had been 11%. In 1981, it was 11% uh, again. 11, 13, 1%. Three years of two-digit inflation in a peacetime, the only time it's ever happened in the United States. Three years of the worst period. Of course, it's so just in the wake of the big increase in oil prices to $34 a barrel, and uh, the price of gold is shot up to $850 an ounce. Didn't quite make that in the round last week when it was getting up around 807. It never made the, uh, the past, uh, past uh, uh, high point that it uh, got into. But why the dollar got overvalued is that uh, then Reaganomics came in to stop the inflation and to get the economy going. And they had the tax cuts to get the economy going. They brought down in the two measures, tax cut from uh, in the highest bracket was 70% at the federal level alone. 70%, and they brought that down at the end of the Reagan term to 28%, from 70% to 20%. So this is a real revolution. And they also had to stop this inflation, so they tightened the money supply, the Volcker Fed, <clears throat> which had created a lot of the inflation, now turned around and tightened the money supply. He went into a short recession, but then the dollar soared. The mark was, in 1980, was a um, dollar uh, 70. Uh, I'm sorry, the dollar was 1.7 Deutschmarks in 1980. But then, five, four years later, it had got up to double that, 3.4 Deutschmarks. Now here's a little lesson, very important to people, to countries that do inflation targeting, because this is repeated over and over again. If you have a given inflation rate, let's say the United States inflation rate is, is 13% or 11%, and then you use tight money to slow that down, the way it, the inflation rate comes down is largely through the appreciation of the currency. And that was what gets it down rather quickly. And the U.S. inflation rate went down to 4% by 1984, in four years. You had, over that period, expanding employment, and you had a falling inflation. You had a Phillips curve that was going in the opposite direction, or more correctly, you had a big jump, a, a big, big reduction in the uh, in the shift a shift of the Phillips curve, so, but, so you've got the inflation rate down to four percent. Let's say that was going to be equilibrium for a while. That was good enough, but now you've got an overvalued currency because you can't sustain it. That you have a either have a currency crisis or you organize the currency to come down. All kinds of countries have done the same thing. Brazil did it in the late nineteen. 1990s, when they had a 40% devaluation. After, they, after you, you, get, you, you get the inflation rate down to zero or 3% or whatever it is, and then it's done through monetary policy, you've got an overvalued currency, then there's got to be a big cut in the exchange rate. Britain did it 
Britain went into the ERM in 1990 with a 10%, almost 10% inflation rate. Then it went into the ERM at an overvalued rate for the pound sterling. And that brought the inflation rate down to 4%. And then Britain got out of the ERM and the, the uh, pound depreciated and Britain was in good shape again. It's that adjustment is equal to, that's very important. If, if, uh, <coughs> if um, the Philippines ever decided to bring the inflation rate down to something like 3%, if they think that was in equilibrium through monetary policy, that would be through an overvaluation of the exchange rate, the inflation rate would come down, but then at the end of that process, there's got to be a quick and dirty devaluation to get back to equilibrium. And that devaluation will not be associated with inflation. That happened before in, in a wide range of cases. It, that's, that just is the, um, if you keep an overvalued rate, you will impose deflation, you will overshoot in that process. It's the dynamics of how, how that thing works. Well, <clears throat> what I was really going to say is that the mechanism of having the United States get China, get Japan to bring the uh, yen, put the yen up, uh, well, what does it do for Japan? I said the dollar was 239 yen uh, at the time of the Plaza Accord in September uh, 1985. Ten years later, the dollar had fallen to its low point of 78 yen. So, to, let's say round numbers, 240 yen to 80 yen. It, the yen tripled in value against the US dollar. 1980s, the falling oil prices had greatly increased the productivity of the Japanese economy. But then, uh, since from 1990, the Nikkei was coming down, it went down to 8,000. And then the um, thing, it changed that for 17 years, Japanese construction house prices had been, and, and business real estate prices had been falling. And, and that, that overvaluation led to stagnation in Japan for 10 years. De devastating period. <clears throat> I'm not asking people to feel sorry for Japan because it's a very rich country with a per capita income of 40,000 uh, 40, people, but it, as a, in terms of macroeconomic adjustment, it was a very, and the year 2000 is the same thing that's been happening with China, attempt to get China to appreciate its currency and to, well, someone put it to cut China off at the knees. This is the, uh, to stop growth or exchange rates. Exchange rate changes uh, don't determine trade balances. After that huge appreciation of the yen against the dollar, the Japanese trade balance is still as high as it was back then. Even from, it's $150 billion today. And it was $100 billion back then that even though this was a colossal increase in the exchange rate, it did not change, change the uh, ex exchange rates, have nothing directly to do with trade balances. If you have a world currency, you have no exchange rate changes, but you have, you have current account balances, deficits and surpluses, that are governed by capital flows. If California has a discovers gold or something like that, there's a capital flow to California. California has a deficit, the other parts have a surplus. And this is the uh, equilibrium. So um, the exchange rates aren't the right thing. Anyway, what we need to do in the exchange rate policy is to rethink them along the lines of honesty, reasonableness, and transparency. I think uh, if you're having discussions about exchange rate changes about China particularly, some of them should be in China. And they should be an open forum so people can debate about this. Uh, so, so the uh, system of managed flexible rates, as I look at it, has been a failure. Three propositions of advocates of flexible rates is that flexible rates would eliminate the need for foreign exchange reserves. These were all said by Milton Friedman, the prime advocate of flexible rates, uh, uh, because they're uncertain about what, they don't know what monetary policy is. There's no criterion a fixed a hard budget, a tight criterion for what monetary policy is. Of course, if you have good inflation targeting policies, 
uh, and they've been pretty stable at that 2% a year. So we can't say you know, they don't do it. But look at what has happened to the exchange rate. When the euro started off at $1.18 and then plummeted to 82 cents, the low point, and then it soared to, uh, well, $1.47. 40% down, 70% up. Huge instability. Just imagine if the Philippine economy had fluctuations to the dollar, uh, dollar peso rate, what that would do. Well, what China would be deadly to China if you had this. Look at some other economies. Ch uh, my country does inflation targeting. What about the, what about the exchange rate? Well, the Canadian dollar for most of the period of Canada's history, since it became a, 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 a young nation in, in, um, in 1867 until then 1950, the dollar American was equal to the dollar Canadian, or at most 10% difference from it. And inflation rates were about the same. But since that period, uh, you've had, well, the dollar went down to 73 cents. It was. In 19, uh, we're talking about the Canadian dollar now, 1974, the Canadian dollar was <coughs> uh, equal to $1.07 American. Not very different from what it is today. A dollar seven was the price. The Canadian dollar was at a big premium. <coughs> By 1985, the Canadian dollar had dropped to 73 cents. And then we had a governor who came in, brilliant man, but he wanted to have the zero inflation in Canada, and he tightened up, and the Canadian dollar appreciated to 92 cents from 73 cents. And then it went down from 93, after appreciated to that point, <coughs> they had an election, and the entire Canadian Conservative Party was wiped out. They went from 300 seats to two seats, in it because the people didn't like the policy. Anyway, after that period in the 1990s, the dollar went down from 92 cents down to a low point in February of, of uh, 2002. Of, of January 2002, it went to 62 cents. And now the Canadian dollar is at a dollar eight or dollar nine. Again, huge swings in the dollar. And, uh, and the, this is to the country uh, next door. now. I'm sure if I were advising anyone <coughs> on, on exchange rate policy, the only one sure, absolutely sure bet I would be able to tell people is sell the Canadian dollar short. Look at the whole history of it. This is an all-time high. It's never been like that. Now, of course, I'm not saying right now it's gone up because Canada's become an oil country, and it's, it's, it'll go up and down a little bit with the price of oil. And, this has made it uh, more important. But anyway, um, uh, and the second thing, flexible exchange rates would eliminate exchange controls, while most countries of the world still have exchange controls. And then flexible exchange rates would eliminate global imbalances, big imbalances, they'd say, because they were forgetting about capital movements. And you have big capital movements today because of global imbalances. You have, Japan has had a surplus since 1980 of $100 billion or more, up 150 to 175 billion dollars, every year since 1980, because the Japanese are saving because of demography, the aging population, people are saving, and there's a, a intertemporal distribution that's going. It hasn't it affected that in any way noticeable. So all those propositions have turned, proved to be false, and that's why uh, we have to rethink the whole process again.